Colombian teachers started a 48-hour national strike. Venezuelan President Nicolás Maduro declared a national energy emergency in response to the latest U.S. sanctions. The Syrian army has repelled terrorist attacks in the eastern countryside of Idlib province. Hi, from the headquarters of Telesur English in Havana, Cuba, this is From the South. I'm Cristina Escobar, and we begin in Colombia, where teachers started a 48-hour national strike on Thursday to condemn the violence they are subject to. The industrial action was called by the Colombian Federation of Education Workers. The Federation's president, Nelson Alarcón, called on all educators to join the action to protest against assassinations, attacks, and threats to community leaders and Colombian teachers. Educators are also demanding guarantees for the teaching professions such as the right to quality health care and adequate funding for public education. And saying in Colombia, opposition leader David Racero presented an application for the opening of an investigation against President Ivan Duque following the accusations made by former Senator Aida Merlano. Merlano, who was arrested in Venezuela after escaping prison in Colombia, accused the Colombian political class of widespread corruption and vote buying, including in the election of President Duque. She also accused the president of wanting her dead. Racero presented the application to the Investigation and Accusation Committee of the House of Representatives if the alleged crimes are proven. Racero will urge the committee to file the accusation before the Senate. Venezuelan President Nicolás Maduro has declared a national energy emergency after the U.S. government imposed unilateral sanctions on the Russian oil company Rosneft for trading in Venezuelan crude oil. The president also announced the creation of a presidential commission to restructure and protect the state-owned oil company PDVSA. Yesterday, a new set of criminal measures, criminal sanctions, was imposed against our oil company and the Russian company Rosneft. We have rejected this batch of measures. During the last three years, a state oil company, Prevesa, has resisted, standing alongside the mobilized working class. The company has been fighting against these criminal sanction measures that aim to destroy Prevesa, which is the main company of all Venezuelans. President Maduro also called on the Venezuelan people to take to the streets and protest against the latest U.S. sanctions. I ask all the people in Venezuela to mobilize for the defense of PDVSA, the defense of the workers of the oil industry of Venezuela. No more Trump, no more sanctions, no more blockades. Long live PDVSA. U.S. Special Representative for Venezuela, Elliot Abrams, threatened this Wednesday to adapt measures against our international multimedia public service platform, Telesur. In a flagrant violation of freedom of expression, the U.S. official assured that the multi-state channel is under scrutiny, claiming it is not actually a news network. Abrams was appointed by Donald Trump to coordinate with extreme sectors of the Venezuelan opposition unilateral coercive measures against Venezuela. The attack on Telesur is part of this strategy. Just a few weeks ago, opposition lawmaker Juan Guaidó claimed he would take over Telesur and even appointed far-right figures to lead the move. Brazil's Unified Federation of Oil Workers on Thursday ratified the temporary suspension of indefinite strike action in order to enter negotiations with the state-run Petrobras company. The decision was taken after the Superior Labor Court decided on Tuesday to suspend a mass layoff of around 1,000 workers, one of the measures that have prompted the industrial action. Our correspondent, Brian Meyer, brings us more details in the following report. Today, the FUPI the National Federation of Petroleum Workers in Brazil temporarily suspended the largest petroleum workers strike that's taken place in the country since 1995. Now the reason for the suspension was that Petrobras agreed not to shut down a petrochemical plant in Paraná state which would have resulted in 1,000 layoffs. But the workers don't trust Petrobras, they don't trust this process of systematic dismantling of the Petrobras system, which started after the 2016 parliamentary coup. And so this Friday, there's going to be a national assembly 
with all 20,000 petroleum union workers voting on whether they want to continue the suspension or if they want to reinitiate the strike. The International Monetary Fund concluded on Wednesday that Argentina's debt burden is unsustainable. Argentinian President Alberto Fernandez highlighted the IMF statement which recognized that it wasn't economically or politically feasible for Argentina to pay back its debt. The IMF also supported Fernandez's suggestion that his government first needs to focus on the social needs of, of Argentinians. The fund also noted the Argentinian government's set of policies to address the rise in poverty while also taking steps to stabilize the economy. And coming up, we have an exclusive interview with Cuban analyst Santiago Perez on the CARICOM meeting that concluded Wednesday in Barbados. Don't go away. Hi, welcome back. The 31st intersessional meeting of the Conference of Heads of Government of the Caribbean Community ended in Barbados on Wednesday with a resolution to improve regional integration and overcome disparities among the 15 member states. The two-day meeting saw leaders discuss the response to the coronavirus outbreak, the elimination of taxes for transport and trade, as well as proposed fixed roaming rates for the region. They also discussed the potential Caribbean-African forum. CARICOM Chair and Prime Minister of Barbados, Mia Motley, expressed that even now the inequalities between poorer and richer CARICOM members would promote true integration. One of the problems that has bedeviled the community for some time has been the issue of the CARICOM Development Fund. And we recognize, as I've said over and over, that in any single market, a single economy, there are winners and there are losers. And it is to that extent that Chapter 7 of the Revised Treaty of Chagaramas speaks to the issue of there being need for a fund to be able to assist disadvantaged countries, disadvantaged sectors, disadvantaged regions. Member states have committed to capitalizing this fund, but this will never be enough to do what needs to be done, particularly with all of the challenges that the region faces at this point in time. Yesterday I outlined a number of them. And we keep seeing new challenges as we did with the COVID-19 virus. And to that extent, therefore, we feel strongly that we need to revisit the structure of the CARICOM Development Fund and to enable it to be able to raise additional funds, whether from individuals, companies, institutions, regional countries and extra-regional countries. In the meeting, the community focused on the regional challenges such as climate change, tackling coronavirus, crime and the importance of political coordination among the members. And to understand the scope of this topic for the region, we welcome Professor Santiago Perez from the International Policy Research Center. Thank you so much, for, Professor, for being with us to, today. The outgoing chair of the conference and Prime Minister of St. Lucia, Alan Shastanet, talked about Venezuela and expressed that for Foreign interference can only escalate the crisis. In the case of Cuba, they condemn the sanctions against the island. How important is the role of the Caribbean community in these issues? Thank you, Christina, for inviting me, and thank you <clears throat> for Telesur for giving me this opportunity. I think that it's quite important that uh, 15 countries of the CARICOM should uh, put their voice in favor of uh, the sovereignty of Venezuela and avoiding uh, an intervention of the U.S. We have to be in the context. You have mentioned the whole uh, sanctions that the U.S. has imposed again and again. It's increasing uh, its sanctions against uh, Venezuela and making very aggressive moves. I think that uh, in that context, the idea that 15 Caribbean countries have spoken loud against the intervention 
uh, of, of the U.S., and they don't mention that, but everybody knows that, uh, is of paramount importance for peace, for security, and for stability in the region. That doesn't mean that all of them share the same view on, on Venezuela, but that principal position and that coherent position is, is, is very positive. The same with Cuba. Traditionally, CARICOM countries have been against the U.S. blockade against Cuba. They have reaffirmed that. And this is, Christina, in the context of the 22nd January visit of Mr. Pompeo and a lot of, uh, of pressures from, from the U.S. to try to divide the Caribbean. And uh, they have not. Uh, yell in, they have not given in on that, and what they have said is that to stay uh, united in a coherent uh, position against the sanction. So it's, it, it's very positive. That's why Mr. Bruno Rodriguez thanked the, the CARICOM position on that. It's part of the, I would say, solidarity among Latin American Caribbean countries. Nobody, nobody would take advantage of any intervention in Venezuela, nor in increasing U.S. sanctions against Cuba. Professor, in the meeting we heard several leaders setting a list of priorities, such as tackling crime, coronavirus and economic integration, the importance of achieving economic integration. But what would be the biggest challenge that still remains in place to see this region fully integrated? I, would, I, would, I wouldn't say one single biggest, but there are a lot of challenges. I would say the political will to remain united and to confront the pressures from outside powers, mainly the U.S., sometimes uh, European Union, uh, in terms of dividing them, I think that, that they have resisted, but there is not always a certain outcome of that. W one challenge is to remain united because there is the force of the Caribbean. We're talking about small islands, we're talking about uh, countries that don't have what, what's been called hard power. Their soft power, Christina, lies in their unity, lies in their will to uh, support the principles of international law. I would say that would be one challenge. Second would be to create mechanism and, uh, and, the, and the possibilities of really making their economies united. Any of them have their own vertical links through the big markets, US, European Union. So the idea, and it's, it's figuring out, of creating mechanism to create this uh, real integration, it's, it's a challenge. And the fact that they have brought uh, uh, to this summit, a lot of private enterprise, private interest. I think it's, it's a good step in that. You cannot uh, integrate a region only based on political will. You have to work from below. You have to work also from social forces, from labor, from different uh, unions in, in terms of really creating uh, a unified Caribbean or more integrated Caribbean. That doesn't mean that it's not. Uh, but it's, it's, it's a way forward. I think that this meeting uh, showed uh, show that. A lot of challenges, Christina. So for being with us uh, today, I'm sure we're going to have you again in From the South uh, and any other day. Thank you again for being with us. Thank you. And now we're taking one last break, but stay with us. We have more. Welcome back. China reported the biggest drop in new cases of the coronavirus in nearly a month this Thursday. 
The death toll jumped to 2,118 on Thursday, with most deaths occurring in Hubei province, the epicenter of the outbreak. Hubei health officials reported 615 new cases in Wuhan and 13 more elsewhere in the province. The National Health Commission said that more than 74,500 people have now been infected nationwide. Members of the Association of Southeast Asian Nations gathered in Vientiane, capital of Laos, on Thursday for a special meeting to discuss the COVID-19 outbreak. The foreign ministers' meeting held alongside China, which is not a member of the bloc, saw the participation of Chinese Foreign Minister Wang Ji. China, for so Asia, has contained the spread of the virus inside China and also the spread of the virus to other parts of the world. China is not only protecting its own people, but also the rest of the world. This has gained precious time for the global response to the virus. Apart from, its Apart from his devastating impact to the health and well-being of our people, the coronavirus outbreak has been massively detrimental to trade, travel and the global economy. And two elderly passengers from the Diamond Princess cruise ship who were infected with COVID-19 have died, according to Japan's health ministry. These were the first fatalities from the virus-stricken vessel. The 621 cases confirmed on the Diamond Princess ship represent the highest number anywhere outside China. Hundreds of passengers, given the all-clear, were expected to leave the ship on Thursday as part of a gradual process expected to last through Friday. Syrian Arab army units repelled attacks launched by terrorist groups in the eastern countryside of Idlib province on Thursday. Terrorist groups launched a mortar and rocket attack on the area on Thursday. The army units as advanced towards the outskirts of al naidab town and managed to repel the attack while destroying terrorist ammunition and vehicles. <laughs> Meanwhile, hundreds of Syrians are beginning to return home with long queues of cars seen at the Nasib Jaber border crossing with Jordan. Displaced and refugee Syrian families are hoping that with the advance of the Syrian army and the liberation of almost the entire country, they can begin to rebuild their lives. Tourists are also starting to arrive seeking to visit a country that has seen seven years of conflict. The Nasib Jaber border crossing was reopened in October 2018 and after Syrian forces defeated the extremists who controlled the area. French workers took to the streets in protest against President Emmanuel Macron's pensions reform on Thursday. This was the 10th day of national strikes and protests against the overall of the French pension system. The French Parliament is expected to debate and vote on the pension reform bill in the first week of March. The proposed law would merge the 42 existing private and public sector pension regimes into a single, universal, points-based system. Early retirement privileges enjoyed by some workers would come to an end. Yes, it is interesting because the government support for a universal points-based pension system is declining. We hear the letter representative of the majority in the National Assembly supporting the government's project. Unfortunately, I am hearing the same general statement about the fact that this project will bring improvement. It will be better tomorrow. But no one is able to tell us in concrete terms how it will be better tomorrow. You have said that we have a government and a majority that are floundering more and more to display their counter reform. We have had some juicy anecdotes. The value of the point that evolves on an index that does not sit. So, there you have it. Determination is still the same. And therefore, despite this school holiday period, there are still people in the street. And we stay in Europe. 11 people died during a mass shooting on Wednesday night in the German city of Hanau. Federal prosecutors said they are taking charge of the investigation into the mass shooting amid reports that the suspect was a far-right ex extremist. Several victims have been identified as Turkish citizens. Chancellor Angela Merkel condemned the attacks and told reporters it appeared to have been motivated 
by the poison of racism. The presumed killer was a 43-year-old German man who held a firearm license and was a member of a gun club. Everything will be done to investigate the circumstances of these terrible murders to the very last detail. However, much currently indicates that the perpetrator acted out of far-right racist motives, fueled by hate against people with different backgrounds, a different religions, or different appearance. Racism is a poison. Hatred is a poison. And this poison exists in our society and it is to blame for far too many crimes. Security forces clashed with protesters in the capital of Guinea on Wednesday following the president's announcement to go ahead with a contested referendum. The demonstrators took to the streets of Conakry to protest President Alpha Conde's proposal to amend the West African country's constitution next month. The referendum, if approved by voters, would clear the path for the president to seek another term. The move threatened to further inflame political tensions after a series of deadly demonstrations. Earlier this month, Conde said the referendum would be held simultaneously with legislative elections on March 1st, which opposition parties have already said they will boycott. And carnival events are underway throughout Brazil. This year's samba bands are expected to offer a particular social justice-themed twist, including issues such as anti-fascism, indigenous rights, and other political themes given the far-right government of Jair Bolsonaro. We've come to the end of this news brief. You can find these and many other stories on our website at telesurenglish.net. And please join us on social media, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. For Telesur English, I'm Cristina Escobar. Thank you for watching.